Well, thank you, Catherine. That was a terrific talk to sort of lay the groundwork on what's going on in the climate on the environmental side, and frankly, to pose it as an opportunity. And what I'm going to talk about are some options. What options do we have? What solutions do we have? And how can we avail of this opportunity to address this huge global challenge? So I'm going to go back in history of where we came from. And those of you in humanities, uh, this is a tribute to you. I'll go back to art. And to really show what happened, how you know, the world that we live in today was not the world but 250 years ago, just only 250. So if you look at the world 250 years, this is when the United States was being created. And you know, that's George Washington, the Revolutionary War, uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, involved in writing the Constitution. And if you look at the, what life was like, you find you know, transportation was that, and lighting was by whale oil. And 250 years is a very short period in human history. It's very short. But it's been an incredible history of the last 250 years. Why do I say that? Because we have come from this to this. This is the world that we live in now. And I call that horsepower to horsepower. <laughs> All right? So we have, you know, we're driving cars at 300 horsepower, 300 horses driving us to a grocery store. Can you imagine? <laughs> and 10,000 horses and high-speed trains, we hope we have that sometime in the United States. Um, 100,000 horses flying across the country, you know, across the United States in a matter of five hours, which would have taken a month or more, you know, 250 years ago. And the other side is here. We have electricity that we did not have 250. This is only 100 years old. So if you look at the whole energy problem, you can sort of divide into two pieces. One is on the transportation side, and the other is the electricity. And we've got to decarbonize both. And the question is, how do we do that? And the long-term trends are that we have to do it, as was pointed out. And that is the biggest opportunity. And the question is, how do we turn the global economies and turn the ship around? And there lies the opportunity. So if you look at what is this, the, the, trans, the transformation over the 250 years, it has had major impact on our economies. That's the global per capita GDP, not even GDP. Per capita GDP has gone up exponentially. And that has largely relied on the use of energy. If you don't have energy, our whole lifestyle go back, goes back to 250 years. Okay? And it's been obviously all mostly about fossil energy. And you can see the ex exponential increase in our use of fossil energy and an exponential increase in our GDP. So people associate economic growth with fossil energy. That means if you don't have fossil energy, you don't have economic growth. And that is just a false conclusion, which I'm going to talk about. There's another exponential increase that has happened. That's a global population. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we had 700 million people around the world. Today, you have 7 billion. And by 2050, it's going to be 9 billion, roughly. Uh, by the end of the century, it's going to be 10 billion with a big error bar. And that error bar depends on the women, uh, the fertility of the women in Africa. 99% of the population growth is going to be in Asia and Africa, not in the United States or not in North America or Europe. The only way to grow population in the United States and Europe is by immigration, by the way. Okay? All the talk about immigration, that's the only way. Um, so this is the world, the population, which is, has a big role to play in energy use and climate change, etc. So if you look at where the people are, this is where the people are, okay? Population density. And this is where energy is. And if you overlay the two, you find Africa with a lot of people still haven't turned on the lights yet. And we really want to enable them to turn on the right kind of lights. Lots of Asia, 400 million people in India don't have access to electricity. But one and a half billion people don't have access to the grid, okay? 
and about another one and a half billion people have access to the grid, but there's no power flowing. Okay. So that's the world. And by the way, that 99% of the population growth is going to occur in those regions. Yeah. Switch back and forth. If the button works, there you go. All right. I actually have a picture where it overlays the two. I'll come to that. So this is the world. And the question is, what do we do? The developed nations have to transition, decarbonize. The developing nations have to have access to energy to get out of poverty, and et cetera, to have economic development. So we have a sort of a dual problem that we have to deal with. So I'm going to first talk about the electricity. And then I'll talk about the transportation and the fuel side. Okay, because that's where the energy lies. And I'll tell you what's going on at Stanford, what we were trying to do. So what is the current paradigm of the grid? The current paradigm is the following. You have centralized generation of thermal power plants, which are generally far away from the um, population centers. Then you have long distance high voltage transmission, you know, several hundred kilovolts. And then you have in the regions where population, you drop down the voltage using transformers to medium voltage. And in a neighborhood lines, at least in the United States, is 13 kilovolts um, on the neighborhood poles and the lines. And then you get about 120 volts, 60 hertz in the United States. You get 220 volts, 50 hertz, many other parts of the world. That's the paradigm. That I call is the Tesla Edison paradigm because this architecture is only 100 years old. Okay? And 100 years ago, that was the internet of that time. People didn't have access to electricity. They wanted lighting. They wanted motors, they wanted machines. That was the internet of the, that time. And that 100-year-old architecture in this paradigm has not changed. That is what I call grid 1.0. And you have this, you have power flowing in one direction, and power only flows in one direction. And why centralized power stations? Because it's cheaper. There's economies of scale out there. And in energy business, as you will find out, cost and scale is everything. You can have a very nice science, but it does, if it does not reduce the cost, and it will never fly. Okay, so it's, it's a commodity at the end of the day. So science, engineering, economics, business, all coupled together, finance policy. And I'll come to a few of those in my talk. So this is the paradigm that we're living in. And the question is, is it changing? And this is the paradigm because the generation, the thermal plant, power plants, were the cheapest way to produce electricity. So let me show you where things are going. So this paradigm is now being questioned for the first time in 100 years. You are living in the most interesting time as far as electricity is concerned. Because for the first time in history, this paradigm is being questioned. How? Here's how. This is wind electricity. And the vertical axis is the levelized price, not the cost. For those of you economists and business types, the price, that means they're selling electricity in dollars per megawatt hours. And this bar out here is $20 a megawatt hour. Okay? It's dirt cheap. Not everywhere in the United States, but some places, but it's going to expand. And these are actual business contracts. This is not prediction. This is business contracts that have been signed of selling electricity at $20 a megawatt hour. Why is this interesting? Why is this a radical change? Because people thought that natural gas electricity, natural gas is dirt cheap in the United States. That was the cheapest way to produce electricity. Well, this is where it is today in the United States. Okay? This is where coal and nuclear, someone asked about nuclear. This is where coal and nuclear are. Nuclear is not being adopted at the rate it should be to address climate change as a base load, large scale, gigawatt scale general power plants. It's because the cost is too high. And the capital exposure to bring a nuclear plant to full completion is a lot. And business wise, it is a very big deal to build a nuclear plant at $10 billion. The utility has to put the whole bank on the line. And that's a risk they're unwilling to take. So cost is a big, big deal. And you find that wind is getting cheaper. Now, this, of course, in the United States is in the Midwest. 
But as the wind turbines get cheaper and cheaper, uh, and you know, further development happens, they get bigger, there's economy of scale in wind as well, this price is going to drop even more. And I should tell you that I should caution you, this price is with, in the United States, with something called a production tax credit. That means if you produce wind, the government will give you tax credit. And that you know, goes a long way. It's about $23 a megawatt hour. So if you take that tax credit away, that price is $43 a megawatt hour. It's still competitive. Okay? That's solar. That's wind. Here is solar. These are actual power purchase agreement prices in dollars per megawatt hour over the years in solar in the United States. And in other parts of the world where there's sun, it's actually cheaper because most of the cost is not in the panel, but it's an installation. Okay, and other parts of the world, installation is cheaper. So efficiency matters out here. As Tom pointed out, the efficient chart, I'll show that again. And that is coming down to the point that if you look at this trend line, it could go even further. The question is, how much more? And it really depends on technology out here. And technology is that if you increase the efficiency of these cells, you've got to install less to produce the same amount of power. And if you install less, the installation cost goes down. If you make a thin film, as opposed to a bulk crystal, if you make a thin film, it's lighter. If it's lighter, transportation is cheaper, insulation is cheaper. So technology really, really matters. So going back to that chart out here, this is the cell efficiency chart. And here is what is called the Shockley Quasar Limit. This is the theoretical limit for single junction cells single PN junction, and that's the diagram of a single junction cell. It's a little rough on the top to capture the light so that it doesn't reflect away, okay? So it's kind of light trapping. But it seems simple. There's a tremendous amount of R&D that has gone into this to make it efficient. All kinds of lifetimes of electrons and holes and all that. I won't go into the details. That's what research is all about, to really figure out how to design this to increase the efficiency of the cell. Single crystal today, Production level, single crystal silicon, is about 24%. Sun power got started from Stanford. Dick Swanson was the founder, okay? 24%. In thin films, CADTEL, cadmium telluride, SIGs, these are production levels about 15 to 16%. There's no reason why it cannot go up to 20%. And that'll be some of your job to figure out how to do that. Multicrystalline silicon, today production level, 15%. They can easily go up to above 20%. And if, it abo if, if polycrystalline thin film cells are above 20% efficiency, it's a game changer. Because that trend line is going to come down and hit the wind. So this is a big, big deal. Technology matters. Science and engineering matter in bringing down the cost of solar cells and wind, et cetera. Batteries. That's the other thing that you hear about, right? Tesla car is all about the cost. The biggest cost is the battery. Beyond that is some very nice packaging, by the way. Okay, it's beautiful packaging. All kind of connectivity and all that. But the cost is the battery. And today, most of it is lithium-ion battery. And lithium-ion battery, as some of you know, has an anode, has a cathode, has a separator in between, has some electrolytes. All of that matter. And today, most of the research is really in reducing the cost, which means most of the cost is in the materials. 60% of the cost in the batteries and the materials. So if you make the battery more and more energy dense, that means for the same amount of material, you can add energy into it, kilowatt hours, your cost goes down. Dollars per kilowatt hour go down. And how do you do that? Well, this is, on the vertical axis is voltage that it can sustain. On the, and the x-axis is anode capacity. It's milliamp hour per gram. So the product is kilowatt hours per gram. Okay, so you find that the cathode material, most of the material that is used today is lithium ion phos phosphate, lithium cobaltate, etc. If you go up lithium manganates or mixtures of the two amazing materials, they're not in production yet, but it increases the voltage range that you can operate safely. Safety is a big issue. So if you could increase the voltage range 
and still have no side reactions. Again, I won't go into the details. It is a big deal because of power density or energy density goes up. On the anode side, anode today, most of the batteries that are there in you know, Teslas and all, are all using graphite. And that is the energy, that's the charge density you can have in per gram in graphite. If you can switch to silicon, it increases by a factor of five or six. Okay, so people are trying to put silicon. So the question is, why not just make everything out of silicon? The anode, silicon is cheap. The problem is that when you, when lithium goes into silicon, it has a massive volume expansion and it just cracks up the silicon and it make, makes it mechanically defective. So what people are now trying to do, and this is going on in startups out here, going on in large companies, how do you use the right amount of silicon so you have mechanical integrity but still be able to increase the energy density. And that is what is going on out here. And you can see that this is with the graphite, this is the trend in lithium ion in battery pack capacity. And this trend is with silicon alloy that is going on. And that is huge. And this is just not even there in the market. This is in R&D right now. But R&D, not just here in Stanford, but also some of it been transitioned into the startups out here. And so if you look at the whole battery pack over the years, this is the dollars per kilowatt hour, which for the battery company is a big deal. For a Tesla or a Nissan is a big, big deal. Dollars per kilowatt hour, okay? In addition, how many cycles you can get, whether it's safety, whether it's gonna swell, you know, it can resist a big mechanical shock in an accident, all of those matter. But dollars per kilowatt hour is a big deal. And if you look at this, this is the trend, and it's not a, the world is not flat in energy, in battery business. Because right at the bottom, these open circles, these open circles are Tesla. Tesla has figured out how to package this battery in the right way. So packaging, trying to maintain the temperature when you're charging, fast charging, still keeping it cool, very important. So packaging, Tesla has figured out, and the other one, the filled circle, is Nissan. So how the innovation is not just in the materials. Materials are important, but how you put it all together into a system is very, very important. And they are at the bleeding edge of this whole business. And that is, you know, of course, this is the projection. Once it hits, they, they predict, well, Tesla predicts that <clears throat> by 2025, they're going to be below $100 a kilowatt hour. It's already come down from 1,000 in 2008. This is the line it's already come down to about 300, 350. So in a matter of, in a 10 or five years, it's come down by a factor of three, okay? And it can go even further. Tesla predicts that it's going below 100. We add a little bit of, you know, juice to that and say like 150. $150 a kilowatt hour is an amazing cost. That's when electric vehicles become mass market. Tesla is not quite a mass market yet. If you can build a car at $200 range, at 200 miles range, and can have the same cost as a gasoline car, that's mass market. And you would think that in the next 10 years, you're gonna see that starting to happen. So putting it all together, you got solar really going down in cost. These are all good news stories. Where's the challenge? The challenge is in the following that during the time of Tesla and Edison, when they built, they designed the grid and the architecture is still the same, they didn't have solar photovoltaics. They didn't have lithium-ion batteries. They didn't have LED lighting. No power electronics, electronic power conversion, AC to DC, DC to AC, the power supplies they didn't have. They didn't have all that. And they didn't have digital communication control and computing. And by the way, all of these are getting cheaper and better. So the grid of the future, the biggest challenge is not so much the reducing the cost of solar and when that's happening. It's happening in the industry by a tremendous amount of innovation. The question is how do you integrate that into a grid and give you electricity in a reliable way because the grid was never designed for these kinds of intermittent sources of energy and storage in a distributed way. It was never designed for that. And the whole ecosystem, which is business as well as the regulatory, all of that is going to change. Business models have to change. So this is in Stanford Slack. We are starting an initiative. If you're interested, let me know. We're starting an initiative 
This is the original infrastructure. This is already in place. The trillions of dollars invested in here. We're not going to throw that away. But what Tesla did not have is computing. So we can have measure, not only measurement, but control in a distributed way. And we have cloud computing that we did not have before. And computing is getting cheaper and cheaper. So this initiative that we have in Stanford and Slack is called bits and watts. Okay? And this is to really figure out how to enable integration of these renewable intermittent resources and other distributed resources, which the grid was never built for, but still make it work in the most cost-effective way. So that is an initiative that you should know. And if you're interested, let me know. And we can sort of get you to the right faculty members, et cetera. And this is not just engineering. This is in economics and business and law, because it has, it's a very integrated issue. Okay? Very quickly, uh, how much time do I have? Very quickly. OK. All right. You already know about, you already know about this. Catherine. Catherine has already talked about this. Um, the average temperature is going up. I'm going to tell you about the distribution of the temperature. Here is a, here's data on the deviation from that average that came out in a paper in 2012 on northern hemisphere summer temperatures. And look at how the distribution is moving. OK? So the average is certainly moving. This is land temperature only, by the way. This is not ocean temperature. Land temperature, northern hemisphere. And you can find that the tails of the dis distribution are sort of going ballistic. Okay? They're reaching five, four to five times the standard deviation at probabilities that people had never imagined about a, decades, you know, a couple of decades ago. So just to give you rough numbers, these are not exact numbers, rough numbers. How much is the cumulative CO2 emissions from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution from the times of James Watt? Roughly around a trillion tons, slightly less than a trillion, about 250 years. So you can ask how much, given the known reserves of fossil fuel, if you burn it, how much more can we emit? Given the known reserves today, by the way, the reserves keep increasing because the technology to extract fossil fuel keeps improving, gets cheaper and cheaper. So how much is that? And, and if you look at that, it's about 3 trillion tons, roughly. If you burn all the fossil fuel that we can access today in an affordable way, it's about 3 trillion tons. Then he asked the question, the first trillion tons, 250 years, another additional 3 trillion tons, how long will it take given economic growth or given business as usual? The number is 75 to 100 years. That's the world that she was talking about. And we have a real challenge. <laughs> then the question comes, OK, how much is the 3 trillion tons of carbon in the form of hydrocarbons, how much are they worth? And that number is tens of trillions of dollars. So this is the dilemma that, you know, talked about the politics, right? This is the dilemma people are faced with. People, society is given these options. Do we keep the 10 trillion dollars in the ground and not use it for economic growth and save the environment? Or do we take that 10 trillion of dollars for economic growth and just to the hell with the environment. Okay, those are the options. It's like asking me, you have two daughters, which one do you prefer? <laughs> and that's just a false choice. It's a very false choice because it's extrapolating the past. And what you really got to do is to invent the future. And this is, you know, there's a very famous saying which really lays it out. The Stonies did not end because we ran out of stones. We transitioned to better solutions. And the idea is to, this is an opportunity to find better and better solution. So Steve Chu and I wrote a paper that came out in 2012 on what those are, what those trends are, and where are the opportunities. And you know, the way I like to put it is that this is the necessity of the mother of invention. This is the mother of all necessities. So what is that? So I'm going to give you a brief history. Has the world faced this challenge, this kind of challenge before? And the answer is yes. And this goes back to 1898, when there was a calling upon science to save the world from starvation. Because the, the population was increasing the quality of water. Water was a little cleaner. People were living more. And there was growing population. There was not enough food. There was not enough nutrition. And the idea was about how do you grow food for the people? And this same issue coming back again now. But this was a massive issue at that time. And the idea is that you need fertilizers. And the natural fertilizers were found in some islands of the Pacific Ocean 
called the Guano Islands. Guano, in the local language in, in South America, is bird poop. And you can see a pretty talented bird up there. Um, and at that time, these islands were filled of bird poop. And they were excavating that. You know, this is the scene that, was, that could have been seen at that time. And they were excavating that. And you know, there were bags of this you know, put together in bags and mailed all across the world in ships. And there was competition between you know, UK and Spain and, and Germany, who had the fastest ship. This was the oil of the 1800s. This was the oil of 1800s. And, and then this was going on. And after a while, the guano, there's only so much bird poop. By the way, things got really smart. Things got really smart at that time because the United States Congress uh, came into the, and I'll talk about that. That got over. And that got over, and by a stroke of complete luck, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, they found some natural nitrates, crystals, which became the next guano. And so there were ships again, there were wars, battles, etc., to get that. And Sir William Crookes realized that that, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was going to get over. Congress, United States Congress, created something called the Guano Island Act. And the act was that any American who goes to the Pacific Island becomes America. And so that was how United States got a lot of Pacific Islands, which became a strategic issue in the Second World War. This was going on in 1800s. And in 1898, William Crookes realized that this was a, you know, he was a physicist, and he gave a challenge to the chemist. Physicists always like to do that. <laughs> and he said that, okay, guys, nitrogen is the issue. We have tons of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Figure out how to make ammonia and make natural fertilizers. And the chemist took over, and Fritz Haber won the Nobel Prize in 1918, who discovered a catalyst, triple bond of nitrogen, very hard to break, and he figured out the catalyst at that time, this is pre-nuclear, was uranium. And it happened at 10 atmospheres. And this was the sign, this was the discovery. And science is necessary, absolutely necessary, but not enough. Came Carl Bosch, and the collaboration between Haber and Bosch, who scaled it, made it affordable to make fertilizers. And he got his Nobel Prize. This was the birth of chemical engineering in 1931. It's a beautiful book called The Alchemy of Air. If you haven't read it, read it. And that changed the world completely. And I call it the biggest, the most important embedded system that you can have because every one of us out here has nitrogen inside us in our DNA and proteins fixed by the Haber-Bosch process. You can't think of a better embedded system than that, okay? And the world population went like that, and the Chilean salt pepper went like that, okay? Made it obsolete. And that's what science and engineering and technology can do, combined with business. Carl Bosch became a tycoon, billionaire of that time. He was a Larry Page of that time, okay? So this is the challenge that you guys have. So if you ask the question, what is our Hubbard Bosch-like challenge, okay? And some of you are Haber Bosch's of this century. So what is a Haber Bosch challenge? Is to do this. Is to take CO2 and make oil from it and turn the cycle and make it sustainable. But it has to be done at a cost at $2 a gallon, less than $2 a gallon. This is extremely difficult. And to do that, you need energy because CO2 is at the lowest energy state. You need to add energy. Hydrocarbon is an energy source. So you had energy, but that energy has to be carbon-free. And so that carbon-free energy has to come from nuclear, wind, and solar. And that cost, it's not the cost of carbon, so it's the cost of energy. That has to be, if you want $2 a gallon, the energy cost has to be two cents a kilowatt hour. Which is why I drew that red line in the wind, et cetera. Because that is where it's going. So it is one of the most interesting times that you guys are going to live in because the carbon-free energy is coming down to that price point at $2, $0.02 cents a kilowatt hour, giving us the opportunity to now find pathways. But we don't have the pathways to go from carbon dioxide and the electricity, really cheap carbon neutral or carbon-free electricity to produce oil. We don't know how to do that yet. And that's where the research comes in. There's a lot of other slides. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and get to questions. But let me, get, let me end with the following. Um, I, talked about 
these two big questions. The two big questions in energy are, are the following. How can we offer access to affordable, reliable, and clean electricity to every human being in the world? Because if you do not have access to electricity, you do not share as part of the prosperity globally. Huge question. We don't know how to do that yet. And the other question is, how can we make fuel out of CO2 or something out of CO2 and close the cycle and make it carbon neutral cycle to stabilize the atmosphere, CO2 in the atmosphere, and hopefully make it negative at that price point. Cost and scale is everything. So a lot of people think this is impossible. That's what people before Haber and Bosch thought as well. So let me end by saying what were the predictions of the, a lot of naysayers. And you'll hear a lot of naysayers, but it doesn't violate the laws of physics. So, so there's some infamous predictions. I'm going to end with this. Infamous prediction in the past and that you should know about. A lot of very smart people made some predictions. This is Lord Kelvin. Radio has no future. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Lord Kelvin was very opinionated, <laughs> but very wrong. <laughs> and he was so opinionated and so convincing that he convinced Wilbur Wright in 1901 that man will not fly for 50 years. Thankfully, there was Orville Wright <laughs> who, combined, who convinced him otherwise and proved that it's wrong because it didn't violate the laws of physics. There were, there were birds flying. Existence proof was there. The best way to sort of put what you guys need to do is the saying by a uh, very famous author, Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic. And it's for you guys to do that, create that magic right here in Stanford and Slack. Thank you. How much time do we have for questions? 12 minutes, okay. Question, right there. Or you can just shout out. Oh, great question. Where does, the question was, if did people in here, given my view of RPA, et cetera, where does university research fit in? Well, let me just say, right, I wish we had Bell Labs for energy today, okay? Where Bell Labs created the information revolution, transistor, laser, you know, uh, wireless communication, satellite communication, all came out of that. We don't have that. That research, if you are to create a new industrial revolution in energy, okay, which is carbon neutral, car carbon negative, as was pointed out before by Catherine. We need that kind of research going on because sometimes people say, oh, it's only policy. Well, policy is important. But by God, I mean, if you don't have the technology to do what I just talked about, you can't do everything by policy. People only say, oh, and technology is it. We don't need anything else. No. You need the policy to pull them some of these technologies in the, you need the markets. In the electricity business, if you don't have the markets to pay for the technology, no one's, that's going to happen. So I think the, at least my view of my experience in RPE was what I said. In fact, there was a New York Times article that, that sort of laid out what I said, is you get a panoramic view of energy. You get all the things, and you can suddenly start to connect the dots. And you realize the importance of technology and the research that is needed to change the ball game. Because sometimes the incumbents don't always realize that you know, there could be disruptions in the best sense of the word. But you also need the financing. You need the new business models. You need the policy, the regulatory frameworks to bring these technologies into play. It does, it's not going to happen automatically. So I think that's the connectivity between all of that is, is really important. And it's really important to understand that. And that's what we're trying to do at Stanford and Slack as well is to get that view. Yeah. Uh, my name is Imanji from the business school, but this question is purely from a science standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you talked about uh, how in 1875, uh, electric motor was invented, and then 1906, the gasoline engine was invented. If the world was undergoing uh, an electricity revolution during those decades, why is it that an electric vehicle couldn't come to the market when the oh. was already there. Oh, let me tell you that the first vehicles were electric. Uh, that time, lead-acid batteries were still around. 
right? So the first vehicles were go back in history were electric vehicles, okay? And of course, they had a big bank of lead acid batteries. In fact, when first oil was discovered by Edwin Drake in Pennsylvania, and a people, he, he said, he claimed that he's going to drill and get oil. And the only oil at that time was vegetable oil and whale oil, right? And he said, I'm going to dig in the ground and find oil. People thought he was crazy. And he found the oil. <laughs> and, and they didn't know what to do with it. And the only thing that they could do was to replace the original technology, that is lighting. You replace whale oil with kerosene oil. Transportation was not even there initially. And the killer app became the transportation when engines got created. And the reason engines got created is because it's just cheaper. Okay? And it's lower efficient. It's 20, at that time, even lower now, car engines are about 25% efficient at the most. Spark ignition engines, 25% efficient. But it's still a viable because it's cheaper. Okay? You get the range. And the energy density in fuel is so much higher than batteries. Right? So that's why it sort of picked up. And of course, there are other forces in play that happened later on. But it was a cleaner technology. Before that, transportation was by horses. And if you have seen pictures of New York City, you know, they were cleaning the horse poop in the late 1800s. So it was an environmental issue because cars using gasoline and engines was cleaner than horse because no one had to clean up the poop. So environment issues can drive this, okay, and being cleaner. But that was the reason why electric vehicles, you know, why gasoline vehicles came up and, you know, sort of stole the show. Uh, let me go out there, then I'll come out here. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, based on your diagram, so I think it's fair to predict that a good portion of energy demand will come towards uh, Africa in the near future based on the fact that there's a huge rise in population not met by electric generation. So um, I, due to the absence of the presence uh, of a grid down there in most of the areas, is there a program for decentralized generation or off-grid generation, which is similar to the bits for yep. watts um, program that you have going on for the current grid optimization efforts? Great question. I think in places where there is no grid, there's an opportunity to leapfrog just like cell phones did for telephone lines. Many places in the world don't even have telephone lines, but they have cell phones. In fact, most of the world has cell phones, but they, some of them don't have electricity. So they take you know, a bunch of cell phones in a backpack, bike to some place, charge them up, and bring it, and there's a value in there. There's a business model out there. <laughs> so there is a tremendous opportunity for innovation of how to do this in the right way. In fact, when I was at Google, I was there for a couple of years, that was the project. How do you electrify? Because if, you don't, if there's no electricity, there's no Google, by the way. <laughs> so, so how do you electrify the people who do not have access to electricity? And technology is important, but so is pricing, so is you know, affordability, et cetera. But the technology cannot be, cannot be half smart. Either you don't make it smart at all. People know how to do that. We, we know the grid did not have information for 100 years or you make it just plug and play, and, and just press a button and it operates. And the, the view that we took at Google was to do the latter, okay? To make it so smart that you don't have to worry about it. And because no one wants to worry about electricity till they don't have it. And then suddenly we say, oh my God, I don't have electricity. So that's the kind of thing that we were thinking of. And in fact, some of that technology at Google is now coming under bits and watts. We are partnering with Google on the bits and watts to bring some of the technology, not just for developing economy, they don't have a grid, but even for this economy where distributed energy is going to be a big deal. And the utilities are now trying to figure out how to handle this because their business model was all about taking the power from here and delivering it to you. Now you are generating electricity. So how are they going to work that out? So this is a very interesting time in that space. You had a question. Yeah, my Mm -hmm. Oh, the lithium-ion battery slide. Okay. Where did I? Yep. So you said that Tesla motors can be great by the So ideally, if you look at this, you 
grab. So the material which would be most ideal would lie on the like the right side, the top right. That's right. Right. If you could which find side? something out here. Yeah. Is this research similar going on in Slack on this? Absolutely. There's research going on. Uh, Professor Ichway and many others are looking at how to integrate silicon into the anode and what kind of new cathodes can be created. And frankly, what is often underappreciated is that there's an electrolyte, there's a fluid in there to carry the lithium ions. Okay. And they only operate in a certain voltage range because if you exceed the voltage range, you get the lithium to react with the fluid, which you don't want. And so that window is very important. You want to go to higher voltage, we can't just increase the voltage because that's why when you do fast charging, you really mess up the battery because to do push electrons and, or ions very fast, you need to go to higher potentials. And then you have all these side reactions going on. So yes, there's research going on in all these materials and not just the materials, the architecture of how you, how do you, you know, design the battery. That's on the material and battery side. That's on the cell side. Okay. Then the, the Tesla guys have figured out to take the cell and package it into a system. And that is an amazing engineering job that they've done. OK, my second question is about uh, fossil fuels, because um, I worked in Schlumberger in oil and gas industry in Latin America. So this word is so heavily dependent on oil and gas these days. Are you optimistic that there would be this one thing or a combination of renewables like contributing and replacing oil by the 21st century? Because this is a very massive challenge. Well, I can tell you that in energy business, you've got to take the long-term view. Because for any transition to happen, despite what the climate needs, the economies as such, if you go back in history, transitions in energy use or energy source of fuel takes about 20 to 30 years at least. So it's fair to say, unfortunately, despite the climate challenges, that oil and gas will be around in our, in our economies for a while. Okay. Now, how many decades? I don't know for sure. But at least in the next couple of decades, it'll be there. Long term, 50, 70 years from now, you know, those are hard to predict. But it will be, that could be disrupted if you come up with the technologies that I was talking about. If you could do that, and by the way, it's important to come up in the lab, the, the purpose of uh, university research. But if you, that does not get transitioned to the industry, because scale is everything and cost is everything. And we're not going to be able to estimate cost at a university. So it's very important to work with the industry in that. And companies like Schumblege and others who are interested in carbon-free solutions, they just don't have any opportunity to invest in because there are no solutions around. So I, I see a zero. I, let me take the last question before you guys take a break. Uh, OK, ladies. Yeah. Well, this is Hannah Schumacher from the Business School. And yeah. I've got a question on nuclear. You're saying that investment barrier for nuclear is quite high for the utilities. So where do you see the role of nuclear power in the reduction of greenhouse gases, especially with the challenge of nuclear waste are the events that took place in Fuku Fukushima? Great question. So let me first address the Fukushima thing. I think Fukushima exposed a risk. Talk about risk. If it exposed a risk that everyone noted. Different countries took different approaches to address it. Germany said that we're going to get off nuclear for political reasons, frankly. Um, United States said, no, we will make our 104 reactors, now 100 and something, fewer than 104 now, to be safer. But nuclear has nuclear waste issues, as you pointed out. We don't have a nuclear waste policy in the United States, what to do with the nuclear waste. Other countries do. Um, there is an investment issue, um, because if you build a one gigawatt power plant, it costs about $7 billion. And if it's not on time, which sometimes it doesn't get built on time, which a lot of cases, it's about $10 billion, And no one's going to expose $10 billion especially when the cost of electricity is, is a little bit higher, right? But it's base load. So the only reason, so what, is, what people are not doing and the Department of Energy has done is to focus on what are called small modular reactors. And small modular reactors are essentially instead of one gigawatt, they make 100 megawatt. 
so that the cost is about a billion dollars. And people are willing to do that because the capital exposure risk is lower. So that's where it's going. But to get the small modular reactor licensed through the nuclear regulatory system out here, which is one of the safest in the world, uh, takes about a decade. And that's where it is right now. But eventually, I think the small modular reactor is where it's going to go. Um, there needs to be a market for this. I think that will be a solution, not just for the United States, but it's a global market. But that's where things are going. But regardless of that, you still have to bring down the cost of nuclear. And we think that modular, modularization, most of the, it is construction cost. It's not the fuel cost. And the construction cost can potentially come down by modularizing it. So I think the nuclear is, has to be a solution, I feel. <laughs> but it has to be done in a way that is market competitive and risk competitive. There goes the gong. I'm going to stop right here. Thank you.